And we are live. Welcome back to another episode of Movie Guys Improvise, MGI. You are listening to Farhad Targaryen. And your boy, Al Rogers. Last episode, we talked about a 2012 science fiction movie known as Cloud Atlas. Oh, not much to say about it, as it was a movie that speaks for itself for a whole three hours long. That was that. Now, for today, I wanted to talk to you about a really old, you know, kind of from left field documentary from 2001, simply called Neanderthal. I think this was a British production, and I was a kid when this movie came out. I didn't really know much about it. It came out, like, on television. Um, And when I was in college, and even after college, I've just been very fascinated with the uh, topic of prehistoric human history and evolution and all of that sort of thing so al did you have a chance to watch it i did got it i I, i'll save my opinion for when when we get to it but huh Mm. (laughs) this movie this movie was your choice yeah I, i respect your choice i went out and watched this documentary for you um but yeah, talk talk to me about this choice. What made you what made you choose this so, Neanderthal documentary? Right. So I'm actually I'm just fascinated with the topic of human evolution in general. I even like took a class on human evolution in college. So the thing about this documentary is that as far as I know, it's the only documentary out there that has some sort of like story or reenactment of the life of Neanderthals um from way way back in the day. So this is a pretty old documentary, though. It came out, again, in 2001, so there has been more research and development that has come out since then, since it's been almost 20 years since since the documentary was made. Um, so a lot of new facts ha- have come out about it, but uh, nonetheless, the reason I picked it was to have, you know, a documentary movie to talk about that could also just open up uh, opportunities for discussion about uh, science, stuff about science in general, so uh did you did you learn anything about neanderthals that you hadn't known before when you watched the documentary um not not really um for the most part i I felt like it was uh just a recap of high school level education on neanderthals and um that that whole era you know what what they ate what tools they made um generally which geographical areas they they were uh, mostly in um the the lifestyle some of the activities that they participated in um it, it was an informative documentary don't get me wrong but um i i didn't take too much away from it okay yeah i i get it and that's fine like i, I will admit parts of it were kind of boring parts of it were kind of sad you know i didn't really there was a scene where uh, the head of the Neanderthal family that we saw kidnapped a Neanderthal woman from another uh, family, just straight up kidnapped her. That was kind of messed up. Yeah, but um, that's, that was more, I think, things like that were thrown in there um, to develop plot. Right. That was to develop plot, but they kind of implied that things like this happened back then. Like, just because just they're showing it and filming it as a story, as a fictional story, doesn't necessarily mean something like that wouldn't have happened way in a uncivilized, you know, unsocietal time frame. You know what I mean? But but you're right. Yeah. They did that for... Well, if you if you look at um, fictions, portrayals of, of what that era looks like... Um, you know, you've got the Flintstones, right? And how, how would the Flintstones go out and get their wives? Well, they take a club and bonk her over the head and drag her home. <laughs> wow. And it, it would be very cartoony, but, you know, if you think about that in real life, hey, you know, you don't just club a woman over the head and drag her home, make her your wife. That's not, <laughs> yeah. that's not how that goes. It's absolutely not. Yeah, we're civilized <laughs> now and we can't be doing stuff like that. So, but that, yeah, that scene was sad. Um, There was also the scene where after she gives birth, the baby that she gives birth to is um, killed because it's wintertime and they just can't provide for the baby. Um, So that that was kind of sad also. And as as time goes on, 
you know, we see as, as they're hunting, they spend they spend basically every single day hunting. I think the narrator says something like they need to consume 4,000 to 6,000 calories a day. I feel like that's a lot, even for today's standards, right? But that's how much the, end, the Neanderthals ate um, way back then. Um, well, that, for, for an active lifestyle, that that's about right. That, that's no different than, you know, uh, a soldier or... Um, or a marine being out on out in the field running around um, eating uh, MREs yeah they have to consume about 4,000 6,000 calories because they're they're burning off so much energy I see um, so that's yeah that that was pretty accurate okay all right so then what that you would expect makes sense okay so that happens so they they spend every single day basically um, uh, hunting um, the, the women do do some hunting as well to pull in their weight. There They show an elderly man who they say was in his 40s as a Neanderthal man, but he looked like an old man, you know, um, as like the oldest person in that family, that group. Um, they knew how to use fire. They demonstrated that as well. They did eat raw food, but when they cooked the food, they, uh, they got more out of it. It was always meat. And then... Eventually, we see the introduction of the Cro Magnon characters, and Cro Magnon is basically the term uh, used to describe European Homo sapiens, European humans, before Europe was known as Europe, that landmass. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so those were the Cro Magnons. Here's what's confusing to me, and my mom pointed this out too when I showed this documentary to my mom one time. Why were the human characters, like, they were clean-shaven and they were bald? So, did, and this might be something that neither you or I know about, but why, did, did humans know, like, know back then, like, how to shave and stuff? I mean, they had, they had uh, face paint and all that. I, I can understand that, but why did they also have full, full clean-shaved faces and, he like, you know, bald heads? Is that, is that just... I, I, I think... That was just the documentary's way of being able to differentiate the the characters out of look. That's what I, I was. I, yeah, I don't think it was actually. I I think that was just uh, some creative freedom that they took, um, as it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, it does not make sense. I mean, that, that's what I was thinking too. Like, oh, maybe they were just doing that so that the viewer can tell the difference between the Neanderthal and the Cro Magnon, but the cro was considerably taller than the Neanderthal, wasn't he? He looked like he was like six foot compared to the Neanderthal guy who was like my height. And his brow ridges weren't, you know, weren't as rigid as the Neanderthal. His nose wasn't as big. They, they explain in the, in the documentary that the Neanderthals evolved to become more used to the cold, really harsh climate of Europe. Um... And the cro characters looked like us. They looked like regular, you know, human people. I felt like if that character had hair and had a beard, it shouldn't have been too difficult to know the difference between them and the Neanderthals, you know? Because they made the Neanderthal characters look pretty ugly. I don't think, like, and if you, if you look at some reconstructions of Neanderthals, they don't look that ugly um, but they made the Neanderthal people look that ugly, especially their teeth. Their teeth look gnarly, man. My God. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, I mean, it's not like they had access to dental health care or <laughs> even basic dental uh, applications yeah. like toothpaste and toothbrushes. Yeah, that's, I think that's pretty accurate for what, what you would expect. Their teeth, yeah, their teeth also were, you know, adapted to eating a little differently than ours were. So there's also that to consider. But so the most, when once the part of the documentary that started becoming really interesting for me was the point where the Neanderthal meets the Cro-Magnon and that point forward. And as the Na Neanderthal, I mean, not the Neanderthal, as the, <laughs> the narrator explains... Um, nothing in the Neanderthal's life could have prepared him for that moment, the moment where he comes face to face with a Cro Magnon. And I thought that was pretty fantastic of, a, of an explanation because 
we were talking off the record just now in that like you know how do how do we know that that it happened this way we don't know there's no way of knowing how exactly one species of human reacted to another seeing a, a member of another species of human will there's no way of knowing how they reacted all we do know is that there was a point in time in Europe and the Middle East and Asia that this happened, that humans, that Cro-Magnons, um, human, just humans, I guess, Homo sapiens encountered Homo, Homo neanderthalensis. I think that's what the species name is called. Now, some scientists are divided because some, some of them say that Neanderthals are a subspecies of Homo sapiens, like it's Homo sapien neanderthalensis, and then there's Homo sapiens sapiens. Honestly, like I'm, I'm not a student of science, so I don't really know what it means to be a subspecies. But if that were true, I feel like Neanderthals would be much more similar to us than, uh, than previously thought. And they are. They already are. Are are what was our closest living relatives on this earth. It used to be. Uh, I mean, it what it not used to be. What it is now is chimpanzees. But from my understanding, if my research is correct, um, Neanderthals were ten times more similar to us than chimpanzees were. Like chimpanzees are not only a different species, they're also a different genus. Uh, Neanderthals are the same genus as us, just a different species. Like the species, like the genus is Homo, Homo neanderthalensis. Our genus is also Homo because we are Homo sapiens. So, um, yeah. but what does what does all that mean to you? Like, okay, got it. What it means... What does it... So, what it means to me is that there was a point in time where there was just a different group of humans living... And when I say group, I mean, like, completely different. Because in, in this day and age, there are all different types of human people out there, right? There are, you know, we all come in different races, shapes, and sizes. But anatomically... We are all the same species. We are all Homo sapiens, no matter what part of the world you're from. However, the Neanderthals were different because anatomically, physiologically, to an extent, they were different because they were a completely different species. Now, what fascinates me so much about this topic is just the fact that um, with, with the Neanderthal Genome Project, which was done in 2010, it has been determined that 20% of the Neanderthal DNA through introgression is part of our DNA. And the most recent studies, I think, find that for most humans of today, 90, 98 to 99% of everybody alive is Homo sapien. And the rest, meaning 1% to 2% of almost everybody, is Neanderthal, which means our ancestors lived and interbred with Neanderthals back in the day. All people except for uh, sub-Saharan Africans, because Neanderthals did not live in Africa. They, on, um, they only lived in uh, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. However, there may have been other homo species in Africa that sub-Saharan Africans lived and interbred with, um, but the Neanderthals didn't live there. That's the most fascinating part of it to me. But does that, does, does that surprise you? It's well, kind of. It kind of well. It surprises me because you know what they say about hybrid, hybrid living things these days. Like for this day and age, is that what they what people say about hybrids is that usually they're sterile, they're infertile. Like for example, um, uh, mules, which is the hybrid offspring of a horse and a donkey, they usually cannot procreate. They're usually like sterile. Like that person cannot have like <laughs> that animal cannot procreate um i think they say the same thing about uh, about ligers and tigons which are the offspring of a lion and a tiger or a tiger and a lion um may, maybe there are cases of them being fertile but most of the time i feel like people say those those like hybrids cannot procreate if that were true about neanderthal human hybrids if that, if that were completely 100% true, then there would be no way for us to have Neanderthal DNA in us. Does that make sense? Right, right. Which is just to say that, yes, there, it, it was possible. It was possible. And, yeah. But, but not in every single scenario. So 
um, and this that's part of the that's part of what this documentary confuses me on. So, this documentary, the narrator says, um, what is it? I think he said something like, um, "Were Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons similar enough to uh, to mate and produce fertile offspring?" We probably will never know, which is to this day and age not true because we found out that that it is true. However, this documentary shows that um, the Neanderthal woman who was kidnapped and becomes part of another family, um, the head of that family gets murdered by one of the Crow Magnons, and then they um, they try to they try to feed him with medicine, but then he succumbs to his wounds and then he dies, and then they bury him. Now, before I get to my main point. What did you think of that? Do you think um and there there is some evidence that Neanderthals did bury their dead and had their own funerals and stuff? Do you think that that's kind of uh, stretching it, or do you think that it was possible that those that the Neanderthals those people did bury their dead? I don't I don't think that's a stretch. I see. I when when I saw the scene, I didn't think anything of it, um, because um, no, yeah, I. Um, it, it may, actually, now that I think about it, it, it may have been done more of, more as a, um, survival technique rather than just as, uh, as a technique, uh, to like show respect for the dead or, uh, or a religious sentiment or anything like that. Um, because leaving traces of, of your, uh, of your fellow men and women, uh, Got it. They're Neanderthals. Yeah. So questionable whether or not you can call them um, men and women as as we know them. But um, leaving your traces uh, could potentially uh, have a you could potentially have a predator following you around. Um, so uh, I I think that was more of a survival thing more than a religious thing. As far as for this documentary, um, again, it's it's. Uh, a plot point and something to add story to this documentary. Yeah, I mean, the it could have also just be what what the Neanderthals did in general. That could have just also have been an easy way to dispose of your dead. You know, having the body instead of it rotting, like burying it, it was just an easy way of disposing. So yeah, you're right. That that it could be that as well. However, with that being the case. That could have also, for back then, that could have also been what Cro-Magnons did. Like, you know, our our direct ancestors, they could have also buried their dead as a way, as a survival instinct as well. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. it could have been something that uh, we had in common with the Neanderthals. But, so, um, yeah, they, bury, they buried their dead. And then eventually the next oldest brother um decides to leave the cave because he's just afraid of uh what what the Cro-Magnons could do next but one interesting thing that the narrator said was um when when the older brother before he died when he met the Cro-Magnon it's po- the 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 narrator says something along the lines of it's possible that the Neanderthal man did not understand the significance of what he just saw, which was a member of um, a different species that he now has to compete with. That's totally possible too. I mean, our biggest factor, like the one thing that the Cro-Magnons and another thing that the narrator said was um, our biggest tool was language, the way we communicated with each other, right? There is evidence that Neanderthals had language too, not nearly as sophisticated as ours. Part of the reason was because Neanderthals kind of kept to themselves. They didn't really need, uh, react, on, interact with other Neanderthal families, and that's part of the reason that led to their demise. Our language was good enough that we, I guess, well, sophisticated enough that we interacted with each other. We knew how to talk. We knew how to communicate. We knew how to trade and work together and whatnot. Working together, I guess, is what brought humans together in order to eventually take over the world. Part of the reasons why Neanderthals um, couldn't keep up in the same rate. But so, yeah, the older brother leaves the cave and that's when the Cro-Magnons move into that cave. The narrator even says things like that happened back in the day. So, um, eventually the Neanderthal woman that was kidnapped and had her baby murdered by the other woman in the clan, uh, turns around and goes back to the cave. And 
how like this this part may have just been fiction because how would she know that it's safe to go back there like you know either either nobody is there or there could be predators there or there could be cromagnons there you know she just decides to turn around and go back you know and the um it works in her favor because the um the cromagnon one of the cromagnons sees her and gives her some meat some food to eat and then they accept her as part of the group for a little while so that worked in her favor now one one of the things that i said i was going to bring up to you off the record was the quote unquote sex scene so you remember when they were playing the drums and one of the cromagnons goes to the back of the cave kind of pushes the neanderthal woman over as she's eating and then yeah has sex with her right okay so she didn't it didn't seem like she objected to what was happening to her but they didn't communicate at all what was about to go happen so do you think something yeah, like but that that's, okay there is there is an honorable consent and you know there's I mean, the way I read the scene, yeah, it was just non-verbal consent. It wasn't a rape scene. Not, come on. Is is that what you thought it was? I don't know. I don't. I don't think so because she she just you know was okay with it, right? Like, um, the guy pushes her over a little bit, and then they just have sex. So, and then once it's done, he just gets up and leaves, and she goes on about her business of eating. So. No. <laughs> what, what was he supposed to do? Was he supposed to turn on the kettle and make her some tea or some coffee? <laughs> like, what, what do you expect? I don't know. They could have cuddled a little bit or something, make it cute. But um, that was that. That was the end of it. But then, as the story goes on, and they they may have just done this done, done this for a dramatic effect. But um, as the story goes on, we see that she's alone. Like she's, we see that she's pregnant, and she's alone. Which implies that the Cro-Magnons abandoned her. Now, I would think that since she's pregnant with his baby, that he would want to protect her so that he could eventually protect his offspring. So why did she end up alone? Or was she just going on a hunting trip on her own and coming back later, you know? But that's not really how, how the scene was jiving with me. How did, how did you interpret her like being alone on the mountain cliff? Um... Uh, I think it was just due to unawareness, like, um, how, how easy it is it for, uh, the, these groups, uh, really detect pregnancy, you know? Um, so I, I think it was just, yeah, just due to sheer unawareness. I see. Um, well, she, she wasn't a virgin, remember, she was pregnant before and had her first baby killed, so she, I feel like she would have some sort of awareness in terms of pregnancy, she just wouldn't be able to communicate that to the Cro-Magnon. Right. The narrator even said when she was kidnapped by the Neanderthals, like she, like even they, it was hard for her to communicate with them because their language was completely different um, to to her, so if that was difficult, it definitely would be next to impossible i guess for her to communicate to the cromagnon that hey we had sex and now i'm pregnant with your baby so speaking of which let me uh, let me drop some knowledge for you so remember how i was telling you before i'm sorry well, what's up no go go okay. for it so remember how i was mentioning to you uh earlier on that um one to two percent of everybody's dna basically except for sub-saharan africans one to two percent of everybody's dna is neanderthal we are all descendants of neanderthal fathers and human mothers so if back in the day um and the, the reason the reason i say that is because um there is no mitochondrial there's no evidence of neanderthal heritage in mitochondrial dna in our mitochondrial dna and in mammals uh mitochondrial dna is passed down by by the mothers so there is no neanderthal her, um i guess um heritage found in human mitochondrial dna and that's how scientists have figured out biologists have figured out that we are all descendants of neanderthal fathers and human mothers so this would mean that back in the day either uh human men just never had sex with neanderthal women either that is the case or 
when they did have sex, the children, the offspring were just sterile or infertile, or the children, the hybrid children of Neanderthal of women and human men lived with the Neanderthals instead of the humans, and they just died and became extinct with the rest of that species. It could be any one of those, um, any one of those scenarios. Um, but um, again, uh, going back to the question of why this is, uh, why you were asking me, like why, why I wanted to talk about this, it's fascinating to me because, like, imagine you being a child, looking up at your mom and dad, and they're, and not that you would know this. But they're two different species. I feel like that would be mind blowing. As as a baby in prehistoric times, you would not be able to comprehend that just because you know back then, there, like there was no way of doing like knowing such things. But thinking about it now, I feel like it's just mind blowing and really really fascinating. Does, does that make sense? I don't know if what I'm saying yeah, making sense to you. It, it, it makes sense, but you you are, my <laughs> you are very much. Um, you're more engaged, more uh, more aware of the subject. You you really like this uh, this subject. Um, for me, no. <laughs> Excuse me. Listen. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Um. This this subject fascinates you, whereas for me, it whatever. So. Even going into the, the documentary, um, uh, I knew that whatever came out of that documentary as far as information, it, it wouldn't change the way I, I view anything. Um, so it's like, okay, let, let's say you have 5%, 10% uh, DNA, uh, Neanderthal DNA, which, it, which is not the case, but let's say that is the case. So what? So this this means that some of your ancestors were not Homo sapiens. That's, that's okay. What that means. And then the question of that is is the same. Well, so what? So this mean? I mean, yeah, I get what you're saying. It doesn't in in the long run of things, it doesn't really matter that much, especially because very little of our DNA is like that. It's still. Fa fascinating. Does it, does it does it affect you as a person? Does it affect you as it does, is it going to affect what what you do tomorrow? Does it affect your political views? Does it affect your level of education? Does it uh, what? Okay, got it. It's uh, it it is what it is. But what's the what's what's the outcome? Um, the outcome is me pondering basically since in a way Neanderthals live on within us it makes me think about the scenario of what if they never went extinct what if Neanderthals and other homo species were still alive now how different would society be you know would our very definition of you know life and uh, differentiating species and other different forms of life be completely different if they were still around, you know, like that, it opens up that whole uh, can of worms for me to to think about. Um, not that that would ever even happen because they are extinct now. It's just fascinating to me to be thinking about this and pondering about the possibilities of our our ancestors and how things are gone. Honestly, it just makes me it just makes me wonder like how things were back then, like how how these different species came came together. You know, they were the next. Aside, aside from Homo sapiens, I think, I mean, Neanderthals apparently had bigger brains than us. They still, we still outcompeted them, but they were next to us as the most intelligent species on, on this earth. So it just makes me think about, you know, how, how it would have been interacting with them. Um, and no, this, this doesn't change how I operate my day to day, how, you know, how I view the world and stuff. No, it doesn't affect any of that, but it just simply is something that I like to think and research about. If uh, does that does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. No. You have a you have a need for uh, you're just very curious about the subject. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Yeah. And I know. And I and I understand the fact that 
not everybody in the world is as fascinated about all of this as I am. Like, I, I understand that too. But, um, yeah, so that's why, of course, <laughs> this documentary was what I chose uh, for for us to watch. Um, and um, to bring again up the topic of how, how it happened, how we were able to get, like, previously the estimates were up to 4% Neanderthal DNA. The most recent studies say something more along the lines of 1% to 2%. Um, the, there's a professor who goes by the name John D. Hawks, who, who brought up, the, who was asked this question before, um, which, and he, he explains it as, do you imagine that these people, uh, humans and Neanderthals were like, they meet each other and they, they fall in love as if they're like culturally compatible, or is it like kidnapping? Like we saw in the documentary, or is it more along the lines of, oh, I haven't seen a woman in so long, and uh, um, he he explains it as um, the be the best way for us to hypothesize how these different species interacted would be just looking at the history of like just general human history. Sometimes it's violent, sometimes it's aggressive, which is still violent. Sometimes it's romantic. And sometimes it's just a matter of convenience, you know, for, for species, like for animals anyway, all animals care about wild animals anyway, all they care about is survival and procreation. They want to eat and hunt and they want to continue their line, right? That's all animals really care about. Humans obviously were more intelligent, but back in the hunter-gatherer phase of the Paleolithic uh, phase, I'm not sure exactly what era it was back then we we cared about survival and we also cared about procreation those would be uh, the the two main things so i feel like as long as we were able to do that then that's that's all that our ancestors really cared about the thing about the hybrids are though um the human neanderthal hybrids is is that those hybrid children how, however it is that they were procreated whether whether the uh, Neanderthal man and human wo woman, whether the Neanderthal uh, kidnapped the, um, the w human woman or fell in love with her, or they, it was just convenient that they, you know, that they met and they both wanted to have children, whatever the scenario was, their children eventually, like they had to be healthy and they had to eventually live to adulthood to eventually have kids of their own and pass down their genes into us basically they had they had to survive they had to have lives comfortable enough where they passed their genes on to us eventually so that they lived on in us you know what I, you know what i mean so whatever scenario was whatever scenario scenario it was back then had to eventually live had to eventually be for them to live to pass on their genes to us does does that all like am i, am I making sense or I'm kind of rambling but yeah you are <laughs> okay yeah you're rambling um but no it makes sense got it okay so yeah yeah um again this this was a topic that i had studied briefly in college like i've read magazine uh magazine articles about it um and i've watched youtube videos about it and whenever new um information about it comes out even that come uh comes to uh to be a topic of interest for me there's another a uh, homo species that was discovered more recently called the Denisovans and there are certain groups of humans who have up to 6% of their DNA that comes from Denisovans which is even which is even higher than the amount that we that most of the human population have from uh Neanderthal so yeah all of this is so um, very very near and dear to your heart <laughs> well there are, there are other topics that are more near and dear to me that I would say but this is one that that is really interesting to me like eventually and this is something else that I talked to you off the record um if there are documentaries that come out that talk about like space and astronomy like those, those are topics eventually that I would want to cover in documentary form of course on the movie guys improvised podcast but since we are nearing the end of this episode on Neanderthal want to go into ratings uh real quick um, I didn't, I also wasn't really fond of the, the music. I mean, whenever the Cro-Magnons appeared on screen, they had, there was a very, uh, 
ominous drum that played you know that made that made the chromagnus almost appear as if they were villains right for this story um but the yeah overall if i were to just give it a rating i would guess i would give it a six out of ten yeah, I'll give this documentary a 6 out of 10. I'd give it um something better if there were more accuracies. And part of the reason why this wasn't too accurate is because it was made in 2001 and more evidence about the contrary has been out since then. But I'm going to give this a 6 out of 10. How about for I, I I don't think that's fair in that, um, yeah, I think for for the time that it was developed, it was, uh, it was accurate. It was accurate content. <laughs> Excuse me. Salud. Thank you. Um. What would you? Uh. All right. So fair. That's fair. Yeah. I wasn't. There. There are other things. I guess I could get into. Like I also wasn't really a big fan of the music, even though this was like a low budget television documentary. Um. What's What's still just Just saying my own opinion. All things considered, I give this a six. What would you give okay. it? I think. Yeah. The This movie is. Uh, not movie. This documentary is middle of the road. Um, it's average. I give it a five out of ten. Oh, okay. Um, Interesting. Yeah, All right. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think you know if if we're gonna do documentaries, the documentaries you'll see rated significantly higher are things with that deal with construction, things that deal with feats of engineering. Those will typically get a, a higher rating from me, at least, because those topics I, I find fascinating. So it's not that I don't like the educational stuff. It's just um, uh, when it comes to this subject matter in particular, it just doesn't really appeal to me. <laughs> Honestly, man, Al, I'm just happy that you gave it a higher rating than Cloud Atlas because that was just your you know, record low of four. I'm just happy that you gave this something a little higher than that so i'm good and i'm good with your with your score of five that's cool average yeah i think that's fair all things considered because this was my choice and it's a topic in science that you're not really that interested in or f fascinated like i am so it's cool yeah six and five i guess yeah that's pretty close this was my choice did you have something in mind for the next episode yeah um what do I have in mind for the next episode? Wow, that is whoa! Uh -oh, caught me off guard here. Uh -oh. um, yeah, wow. Um, I was not I was not prepared to provide a movie for it today. Uh -oh. um, give me. Let's see. We've done John Wick. Mm -hmm. We've done. Um, we did a little bit of Batman. We've done some superheroes. A lot at this um, point, yeah. Uh, tell you what, we'll we'll go into the the realm of comedy and uh, watch a movie that has resonated with a lot of people in America. Um, we will watch uh, the Office Space. The Office Space. I think space? it's called Office Space. Um, it's uh. It's a movie that really dives into the inner workings of day-to-day -day life in America, working in an office, and the annoyances that come with working in in that kind of environment. Okay. So. At first, I thought you were about to recommend like the first episode of The Office, the TV show, which seems to be everybody's oh, no. favorite. But so, Office Space is its own movie. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah, I don't think we've done a comedy yet, have we? I don't think. No. All right, so this will be the first. Cool. And yeah. it's it's funny because my the recommendation I have for the next episode after your next one is also going to be a comedy. Like I already I already know what I want for my next episode. But okay, the next episode following up Neanderthal will be what you said, the Office Space, right? Yeah. All right. Cool. Office space. Looking forward to it. So that concludes this episode of Movie Guys Improvised. You have been listening to Farhad Targaryen. And your boy, Al Rogers. Thank you all so much for listening to us and catch us next time. Take Peace. care. <laughs>